Okay, balance is very important in physics. The balance of forces, forces balanced against each other. One of the principal forces you have to balance against is friction. Friction is any force that opposes motion. It, it's caused by two bodies being in contact. And when I say bodies, in the loosest possible sense, because air is also a body, so you can have friction because you're in contact with the air. You can only really be frictionless in this world if you're not in any medium, i.e. you're in a vacuum. Now, the chief way to reduce any sort of friction is a lubrication. Not too liberally used, obviously. Um, lubrication actually doesn't just make it smoother. It actually separates the bodies out. You see, they get further apart. You see, what normally happens is all the spiky bits, the spiky bits, spiky bits, they, uh, there you are, there's spiky bits there. They, they catch on each other. But the lubricant physically moves them. The viscosity of the lubricant physically keeps them apart. And because they're no longer... Uh, touching each other they're no longer in 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 such contact there's still they reduce it to friction reduces of course doesn't eliminate because there's also friction with the liquid itself the liquid itself has friction in it so the particles in the liquid are rubbing against each other the solid is rubbing against the liquid so there is still friction but it's not as great because they're the two solid bodies are not catching against each other Friction has its advantages. We couldn't walk without friction. Uh, but it has its disadvantages, uh, wearing down machines, created heat, that kind of thing. Now, more interestingly, momentum. Momentum is always 100% conserved. And how does this actually work? Well, it's fairly simple. Before this gentleman puts the match onto the uh, fuse, there is zero momentum. The cannon and the cannonball are at rest. As momentum is velocity times mass, if there's no velocity, there's no momentum. As he fires the cannonball, the cannonball has momentum in this direction. But the cannon then has to have momentum in that direction to balance it, or else it destroys the idea of momentum. So momentum created by the cannonball in the forward direction, going to the right, must be balanced by the recoil going to the left. And it's perfectly balanced. It's literally equated. So we can use that if we know the mass of the cannon and the mass of the ball and the mass and the speed of the ball, then we can work out the speed of the recoil. Similarly, if we know the speed of the recoil, we can work out the velocity of the ball without having to stop it in midair or take photographs of it or anything. This is very simple mathematics, as you can see. Slightly more complicated is when we have something strike something else. Here, the ball of three kilograms is coming in, there you are, at 10 meters per second and striking the six kilometer ball, which before is at rest. It's at rest. Now, as it strikes it, the three kilogram ball being the lighter one, bounces back and the six kilogram one is pushed off in this direction, as you can see by the arrow. But at what velocity? Well, we use momentum to do this. First of all, we have to understand that in a closed system, i.e. it's closed because there's no outside forces outside that. Nothing else is acting on it. In a closed system, the linear momentum is always conserved. So the momentum before is equal to the momentum afterwards. Well, the momentum before is entirely given by this velocity on this weight. So it's 3 times 10. Afterwards, this is moved off in the minus direction. So we have to express 3 times minus 2 as the momentum on the other side. What's left, therefore, what momentum is left, goes to the green ball there. It's 6 kilograms times its new velocity. We put in all our numbers and we see that with actually moving away, this velocity is equal to 6 meters per second. So the six kilogram ball is moving off with six meters per second of velocity. Now we can do this experiment much more nicely with an air track. Here the air track using the same timer involved. Now we must remember to level the air track. That's a very important level. How do we level an air track? This is true for all air track experiments. What you have to do is put one of these vehicles on it and just leave it there. 
If it doesn't move left or right, then the air track is level. Now, why do we level it? Well, we use the air track to remove friction. We level the air track to remove gravity. So air track gets rid of friction, level air track gets rid of gravity as a force. And then we can deal with a, a frame of reference which is independent of those two forces. So we have a, one vehicle we set in motion, it sticks to another vehicle because there's tiny little bits of Velcro or a pin and a cork or blue tack, and the two of them come together. So we take the velocity in the same way as before with the uh, light beam before it, the collision and after the collision, and then we should be able to use the same calculation as we just used to prove the conservation of momentum. We work out the momentum before by multiplying the mass of the first vehicle by its velocity as calculated. And then we work out afterwards by adding the mass of the two trolleys together, multiplying by their new velocity, and then that number should be the same. Those two numbers should be exactly the same. And here's a little question for you. We'll just go through this quickly. Uh, shopping trolley, 12 kilogram, runs along a smooth floor uh, here at 3.5 meters per second, strikes a second trolley. What's the initial momentum of the trolley? Well, momentum, which is usually called P, doesn't matter. You can actually just use the word momentum just as easily. Mass times velocity. Well, 12 times three and a half is 42. After all, 42 is the answer to everything. We all know that. So what's the common velocity after the trolleys collide? Well, they've got twice the mass. If they've twice the mass, then they've half the velocity. It's as simple as that. We could divide by the 24. You can have 42 divided by 24. That's the new mass. That gets us our new velocity. It turns out to be 1.75 meters per second. Uh, the units of momentum... Uh, are just the units that you're using. So it would be kilogram meters per second would be the unit for the uh, momentum. But you should write them down. You should always write units down. Newton's laws. Ooh. Yeah, you have to remember these. Uh, you know, freeze it and go over them a couple of times, but I will read them through for you. Everybody stays in its state of rest or constant motion until an outside force acts on it, meaning it doesn't do anything unless there's an imbalance of forces. An imbalance of forces is what creates a change in velocity. Secondly, the rate of change in momentum is proportional to the applied force in the direction of the applied force. That's the law. This F equals MA, that is a, a result of the law. It's not the law itself, and you can't write it down as Newton's second law. The third one, incredibly famous. To every action, there is equal and opposite reaction. Freeze frame. Now, Newton's second law coming to if, if <laughs> F equals MA. Right, so Newton's second law is force is proportional to the rate of change in momentum. Okay, you also have to add in the direction of the force. The rate of change in momentum is in the direction of the force. But uh, this is the mathematical part that just the force is proportional to the rate of change in momentum. Okay, we write that down like this. If momentum is mass times velocity, then after it's mass times the final velocity and before it's mass times initial velocity. And a change means the difference. The rate means divided by time. Now we take our m as a common factor and v minus u over t, as you can see, is simply a. It's a classic definition of a. So we end up with this, proportionality. Force is proportional to ma. Now to change any proportionality, into an equation, we have to introduce a constant. We call the constant here k, and it changes forces proportional to ma into force equals equal kma, where k is a constant. Now, in order to get the constant to be 1, to give us the force, force equals mass times acceleration, we have to define the unit of force as 1 newton when 1 kilogram is accelerated by one meter per second. That's how we get k equal to be one. If we define one newton as to be equal to one kilogram accelerated by one meter per second, that makes k one for all values, and we can use the simplified formula F equals ma. And again, this is the uh, experiment we saw before. This is another place to appropriately look at it. Again, don't forget to level the air track 
and you measure the length of the card and the time to give you the velocity and eventually the acceleration. Eric the camel. Eric is my favourite camel. Eric is a friend of mine. This is Eric standing on a road. Eric is balanced. He is chewing away his cud. That's, uh, that's not rude, by the way. That's uh, sort of a grassy sort of substance. Um, and the weight of the camel on the road is equal to the reaction of the road on the camel. Ha ha. If we no longer have a road, the camel falls because the weight of the camel is no longer balanced by the reaction of the road. And this is why you have to have balance. In order, if anything is stationary or traveling with constant velocity, there is always a balance of forces. If there isn't a balance of forces, there is always an acceleration. Now, so this Mini is traveling exactly at 40 meters per second along the motorway. It's constantly traveling at this speed. It's not flying up in the air and it's not sinking into the ground. This means the forces on it are all balanced. The engine force pushing it forward is balanced by the frictional force holding it back, causing it to travel at constant velocity. If there wasn't a balance between these two forces, there'd be acceleration or deceleration. Reaction and gravity are equal to each other. This is why it doesn't fly up in the air or sink into the ground. All these forces are balanced at this time. Force is simply, uh, as I said, mass times acceleration, as we did from Newton's second law. And we can work it out at any point mathematically by knowing the mass and the acceleration. This would be the net force. For instance, the two gentlemen who are playing motorboating up there, blah, 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 uh, they are, the one in the purple trunks, for those people in black and white, is pushing harder, and so he's accelerating the one in the blue trunks. However... It's not just his force for accelerating. The gentleman is trying to resist slowing down the acceleration. So we don't have, we have a net force, a difference between those two forces, which creates the acceleration. Here, the Mini is accelerating from rest in the first picture at 200 newtons. That would give it acceleration. In the second picture, there is still acceleration. But in the third picture, there is no acceleration, only constant velocity, because the forces are balanced. And in the last one, the engine is either turned off or braked or something like that. The force is only a decelerating force. The, the object decelerates. So, a car of mass of 500 kilograms has an engine that produces 3,000 kilonewtons of force. What is the friction if the car is accelerating at 1.1 meters per second squared? Well, first thing we always write down F equals ma. Remember, we always write the formula down first. What do we know? Well, we know that the car is ex has 500 kilograms and is accelerating at 1.1, which gives us, of course, 550 newtons of force. What does that mean? Well, it says the engine is producing 3,000 newtons. But there's only 5,000, sorry, 550 newtons are actually being used. So what's the other stuff? It's friction. The friction on the car is the difference between what we're providing and what we're actually seeing in terms of net acceleration. In this case, as you can see, it's uh, 2,450 newtons is the friction on the car. If the engine stops, how long before the car stops? Well, in this case, this frictional force is now the only force on the car. So we calculate that frictional force with the mass to find out the deceleration, and then we put it into the motion formula. OK, so if a weight's on the end of a piece of string, the tension in the string, the force downwards is 98 newtons. In this case, the tension in the string balances the weight. So if the weight is 98 newtons, then the tension in the string is 98 newtons. However, if we accelerate the mass upwards, we add weight to it. Because now, as well as the 98 of weight, 
We've also got a force down of the 10 times the acceleration of 1, 10 newtons. So now the total force or tension string is 108. So as we accelerate things, we increase the force on them. And that means the tension in the string is 108. And that's why the string is more likely to break when we start accelerating the body from rest, because we increase the force on it, because we're accelerating the body upwards. If it's being lifted at constant velocity, then that's when you get a constant force, the same force as gravity. If you want to stop the spring, or string from, or spring, could be spring, but it's string in this case. If you want to stop the st <laughs> stop the rope from breaking you have to accelerate slowly and if you accelerate slowly you don't increase the force greatly okay last thing this is loads of gentlemen in the lift gentleman in the lift is stopped so his weight is whatever it is 83 kilograms 83 newtons, 830 newtons is his weight right uh it could also be traveling at constant velocity v could be constant that's also possible. It doesn't have to be uh, stopped. It can have zero acceleration when it's traveling at constant velocity as well. Now, supposing the elevator is going up and it's going up with an incredible acceleration, the same acceleration as gravity. That means that if he looks at the weighing scales, he actually sees 1660 newtons. He's literally doubled his weight because he's being doubled his acceleration. If he's going down with an acceleration of G, essentially he's falling. And when he's falling, he is weightless. He has no weight. The scale will read zero Newtons. Because as you fall, you don't have weight because there's no resistance, there's no reaction. Okay. This is a nice little um, question from 2012, question six. That's a picture of the gentleman Kittinger. That's the original guy who jumped from the height from the balloon without all the accoutrements that the other gentleman had. I mean, to say this guy is brave is probably putting it mildly. Um, very careful about this. Uh, just answer the questions which are written. Don't imagine what the question is. Read the question, answer the one that's there. That's the key to doing this question. And of course, there's plenty of uh, advice online for those people who get stuck. Okay, thanks.